All right. Thank you. Well, I am very excited to uh, be introducing my friend, Mr. Harold Plunkett, who is our speaker today. Harold currently serves as a CEO of the Sanctuary Hospice House. He is the former Dean of Health Services at Itawama Community College. Prior to his work as Dean, Plunkett spent 25 years as Program Director and Senior Instructor for the Respiratory Therapy Program at ICC. He worked in all aspects of respiratory care, including emergency care, adult, pediatric, and neonatal intensive care and pulmonary rehab. He was also a pulmonary function technician, an echocardiographer, and early in his career, he was an EMT registered ambulance driver. He is award-winning pen and ink artist and has also been cast in numerous acting roles with the Tupelo Community Theater. He is married to a wonderful lady named Brenda Caldwell Plunkett and has two grown children, and he is a proud member of our Rotary Club. So uh, we're pumped to have Mr. Harold, and uh, Mr. Harold, I'll give you the floor, sir. Harold, you're muted. I can't hear you. Face bar. Can you hear me now? Okay, everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, Jenny, are you ready to split the screen so we can see the PowerPoint? There we go. Okay, and you can see me also. Perfect. Okay, um, let me start by just saying um, over the last several months, I've had a number of individuals come up to me and say, Harold, can you explain to me what a ventilator is? I hear that on the news all the time, that uh, we're short of ventilators, that they're in uh, uh, you know, a significant shortage, and that there are individuals that are on ventilators. Exactly what does a ventilator do, and how does it function, and what's its purpose, and what are the indications and hazards? So I thought I would, matter of fact, uh, I had... Uh, told uh, Robbie several weeks ago, if anyone um, uh, was not able to speak, I'm actually filling in from some, for someone who uh, uh, had, to, had to cancel at the last minute. And I told Robbie I would be available because I've made this presentation several times over the last few months. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, me mechanical ventilation, first of all, doesn't cure any disease. It's strictly supportive. Uh, in one of the, I guess, the simplest examples of a ventilator, which also goes by the name a respirator and a resuscitator. Those are essentially all the same thing. Um, uh, but uh, the best uh, uh, term to describe uh, uh, the machine is a ventilator because that's essentially what it does. It moves air in and out of the lung. Probably the perfect example and the simplest example of a ventilator is mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Uh, you're actually, with pressure, pushing air into a person's lungs and then the patient passively exhales. Another example, if I take my finger off the space bar, can you still hear me? So I'm gonna have to hold down the space bar. Okay, here's an example of one of the, I guess the simplest uh, mechanical ventilators other than manual resuscitation. And that's exactly what this is. This is called an Ambu bag. And I can squeeze this bag and I can push uh, air into the patient's lung. And all ventilators provide this same function. And that is, I can control how much volume. This bag happens to be two liters. So I can push up to two liters of air into a patient's lung. So that's one thing it does. It delivers a volume of air. The second thing I control is I can control is the frequency. I can give 20 breaths a minute. I can give five breaths a minute. Uh, and the third thing that a ventilator controls is how fast I push the air in. Uh, that is the flow rate is what we call it. So I can push it in slowly or I can push it in fast. So essentially the three elements of all ventilators uh, would be volume. That is how much we're gonna push in the lung each breath the frequency, that is how many times we're going to deliver a breath in a minute, and then how fast, which is the flow rate. And that's one of the things that the respiratory therapist does in, in setting up a ventilator is they'll set a volume, they'll set a frequency, and they'll set a flow rate. Uh, for the average 150-pound adult male, 
uh, tidal volume, the volume that, that you take with each breath is around 500 milliliters or 25% of a two liter Coke, if you will. So about 500 milliliters. Uh, in terms of the breath rate, it's usually set on anything from around eight to 14 breaths a minute. And then the flow rate is set to be able to deliver that volume of air in about one second. So that's some of the things that the respiratory therapist does. So every ventilator, mechanical ventilator that you'll see in a hospital in ICU setting, it'll have a volume control, it'll have a frequency control, and it'll have a flow rate control in an effort to adjust the, how long it takes to deliver the breath. So all of them have those three uh, attributes, if you will. If you look at the drawing on the screen, I didn't realize until I, I did the PowerPoint that I wasn't going to be able to uh, take my laser pen and show you the different parts. Uh, so I, I, I drew this um, illustration and then I went back and color coded it so you could, you could see all the different parts. So if you look up into the uh, right hand corner there in the red, you'll see where it says ventilator. Um, so that's actually machine and uh, they come in various sizes. And so uh, the, the ventilator will have controls, again, where we'll set volume, we'll set frequency, we'll set flow rate, it'll give us an inspiratory time, and then it'll also have a control to be able to set how much oxygen. Uh, room air, we're breathing 21% oxygen, so the machine is able to give anywhere from 21%, which is room air, or you can turn it all the way up to 100%. So we're going to give a volume a certain number of times a minute, uh, at a certain oxygen concentration and at a certain frequency or rate. As soon as that breath is delivered, um, it's gonna pass through, if you'll look in the blue section there, it's co color coded, that, that breath, that volume of air is gonna leave the ventilator and it's gonna pass through a humidifier. And the humidifier is gonna warm and humidify that air so that by the time it reaches the patient, it's gonna be uh, um, uh, uh, body temperature, 98.6, and it's gonna be fully saturated with water or have a 100% relative humidity. As the uh, gas flows through the inspiratory tube, and you'll see that tube there with arrows, uh, it's blue and it has inflow. Whoop, don't change slide, just stay on that one. There you go. And it, that's called the inspiratory limb where you see the inflow. And that part of the circuit or the ventilator circuit, we call it, is going to push from the ventilator uh, through the humidifier, through the inspiratory limb, which is the inflow tube. And that's going to travel uh, to the patient and it's going to pass through what we call an endotracheal tube. And that's that yellow device. And you may have heard of those things before. Um, we're going to place it in the patient's mouth. It's going to go down through in between the vocal cords into the patient's windpipe or trachea. And then on the tip of that tube, and the tube is about as big around as your finger. And it, uh, if this helps, the diameter is gonna be anywhere from about, oh, 7.5 to about 11 millimeters. And they come in various sizes, a half uh, millimeter increments. Anyway, that cuff is inflated, just a very soft, uh, pliable cuff. And we inflate that with air and that's gonna seal off the lung so the air won't leak out because we're pushing it in under pressure. So the air will pass from the ventilator, through the humidifier, through that blue tubing, the inflow tube. It's then gonna go into the patient's lung and it's gonna pass through that endotracheal tube. And uh, it's not gonna be able to escape uh, because uh, we've got a cuff. And then the patient's lungs will fill up and then a valve is gonna open back at the ventilator and the patient's gonna be able to exhale. And when he exhales, that air is gonna pass through the outflow tube, which is uh, orange. And then that breath that the patient exhaled is gonna travel back to the ventilator. Once it enters the ventilator, it's gonna pass through a measuring device and it's gonna measure the volume. And you're gonna have a display on that ventilator. Let's say we set it at 700 milliliters and that's the volume. So we expect 700 milliliters to leave. And then when the patient exhales, we would expect 700 milliliters to be exhaled. So there's gonna be a monitor on that machine that has the amount of air that leaves the machine and the amount of air on exhalation that returns to the machine. And it should make sense to you that those should match. So if you got 700 going in, you ought to have 700 going out. Then there's also alarms on the machine that will, for example, if you have 700 going in 
and we only have 600 going out, then we got a problem. We got a leak somewhere. It could be in the endotracheal tube where the cuff isn't inflated enough. It could be a leak in the patient's lung, which is a lot more serious. Um, or they could be a leak in the tubing somewhere. So uh, the, the air then will pass uh, through that measuring device. And then if you look up there at the little green device, um, the, after it passes through the exhale monitor device, the machine will, the, the breath will then exit the machine through a bacteria filter and then just go into the room. So that's basically how it works. So it's real simple. Um, from the machine to the humidifier, to the inspiratory limb, through the endotracheal tube, into the lung, and then the patient's gonna exhale and it's going to, it's gonna go back out the expiratory line, the outflow tube, into the machine where the volume will be measured again, and then it'll exit the machine and pass through a bacteria filter. Now, the other knobs on the machine essentially have to do with monitoring. And there's a lot of alarms and monitors on the ventilator. For example, you'll have a low exhale volume alarm. So if you got 700 going in, you ought to have 700 going out. So you'd set that alarm at about 695. So if the exhale volume drops below 695, you'll get an alarm. If the patient's able to breathe on his own, and let's say he's breathing five times a minute, you would set it at four. So if the patient breathes less than four times a minute, then you'd get an alarm. You also have low pressure alarms and high pressure alarms, and they alert the respiratory therapist and the other team members to other problems that might be going on with the machine. Uh, so that's essentially how the machine works. And as far as now that you kind of see how it works and what it does, um, the indications, the first one is apnea, uh, which is the cessation of breathing. Uh, we'll put this ventilator on patients that aren't breathing at all. And it's usually due to things like a drug overdose or they've been, uh, they've had head trauma or maybe they got too much anesthesia during surgery and they're slow to wake up. Um, those patients, uh, uh, for example, if it's a, an anesthesia issue, they'll wake up and you take them off the ventilator. Same, same case with drug overdose. But then patients who have had head trauma, significant or severe head trauma, uh, sometimes, um, uh, you know, they, they don't come off. And a lot of times, a couple of days after the trauma, they're brain dead. And, the, you know, the physician will talk with the family. And at that point, the patient's usually taken off. Uh, but certainly apnea is, is one cause to be put on the ventilator. The other two are ventil ventilatory failure or ventilation failure and oxygenation failure. And those kind of work hand in hand. Your lung does two things. One, it takes in oxygen and then uh, well, the process, well, let me say this, the process of uh, aerobic metabolism states that uh, our primary fuel uh, is oxygen, along with, you know, carbohydrates and protein and fat. Uh, but one of the primary fuels is, is uh, uh, oxygen. And carbon dioxide is produced as a byproduct. And it's the lung's job to take in oxygen and then to eliminate the carbon dioxide. A low oxygen or a high carbon dioxide, both of those are problems and they're significant. So if you have a patient that has a low oxygen, uh, that may be an indication for a ventilator, or if the patient has an extremely high CO2 and his lungs are unable to eliminate that carbon dioxide, that would be another reason to put a patient on the ventilator. In terms of diseases, there's not a particular disease. It depends on how severe it is. For example, some people get pneumonia and they're given antibiotic and sit home. Some people, their pneumonia is more severe. They end up to the hospital, get antibiotics, IV. They're given breathing treatments. And then the severest cases that are patients that their lungs are so stiff due to inflammation that um, they're not able to ventilate and they're not able to oxygenate properly. And those are the folks, especially as it relates to COVID, that end up on ventilators. I'm not sure what the percentage of patients that... Um, develop COVID actually end up on a ventilator. And I'm not sure what the success rate is in terms of the number of people that get so sick that they end up on a ventilator. I'm not privileged to that information. I'm not sure, uh, you know, that's out there yet. Uh, but at any rate, uh, these patients that end up on a ventilator from COVID, they are very, very sick and their lungs are very, very stiff. Um, and so what becomes an issue is when you are, you're given positive pressure a normal lung, for example, you can give them a normal volume and it takes about maybe 10 centimeters of water pressure to ventilate. And, and centimeters of water pressure is the 
um, uh, unit of measurement that we use when we're pushing air into a patient's lung. But to give you an idea, if a normal person has normal lung compliance and resistance and their lungs aren't stiff and there's no disease, it's going to take about 10 centimeters of water pressure to ventilate them. These patients with these stiff lungs, their pressure may go up to 50 and 60, which is significant because it, when it's three or four times normal to be able to push that air into a patient's lung because those lungs are so stiff, uh, you, you run the risk of uh, tearing and injuring the, the lung further. And a lot of times that leads to significant trauma to the lung. So uh, it takes high pressures to ventilate them, but then when you use those high pressures, it actually damages the lung. So you can get into really significant problems that, um, um, just kind of a vicious cycle, if you will. Um, and there's various uh, therapeutic techniques that the respiratory therapist can employ to try to minimize pressure, but at the same time, allow for, um, um, uh, you know, good oxygenation and the ventilation. Um, one of the things you may have heard, if you've had a relative on a ventilator, you'll hear the term PEEP. So I'm gonna go to the next slide, Jenny. Here we go, Oop, back one. Okay, there we go. Um, this is another crude drawing of mine. If you look over on the left, and again, I wish I had a laser pointer where I could, uh, uh, or some kind of mechanism where I could actually put a cursor or something on this to show you what, but if you look over on the left side there, um, you'll see these things perfect, Jenny. These things look like um, little air sacs, and that's exactly what they are. They're a VLI is what they're called. And you have about 300 million of these in your lungs. And um, as, you, as air goes down your windpipe, you have branches that get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you reach the distal end of the lung and you have these tiny microscopic air sacs. And they're generally inflated all the time. And when you take a breath, they fill up. And then when you exhale, they empty, but they never completely empty. Uh, for example, if you push all your air out and you push as much as you can, you keep pushing and keep pushing till you can't exhale any more air, you've still got air left in your lung. And so um, um, the left side shows normal alveoli. And if you look over where the blue part is, that's the, the blood that's blue. Uh, I'm still on the left drawing. Yeah, uh, that's blood returning to the lung after it's went to the body and, and fed the body oxygen. And the blood goes from red and then to blue when it loses its oxygen to the tissue. And then notice when it gets to the alveoli, it begins to turn pink and then red. And the, what's happening is, is these little air sacs are, are filling the blood with oxygen. And when the blood leaves the lung, um, it's carrying a high degree of oxygen. So the blood going into the lung is low oxygen. When it leaves the lung, it's high oxygen. Now, when the lung gets real stiff due to pneumonia or other diseases, especially with the, the COVID related pneumonias, the lung gets incredibly stiff and it actually shrinks and the VLI collapse. So if you look over at that right side, um, you can see just by looking at that, the blood is going into the lung, but look, when it leaves the lung, it didn't pick up any oxygen because the interface, that is the alveoli are collapsed and they're no longer touching the capillary. So they're unable to give their oxygen to the, to the uh, bloodstream. And that creates a significant problem. So what we have to do is reinflate those alveoli. And we do it using a process called PEEP. And that's called positive end expiratory pressure. And it's, it's really quite simple. And even the earlier ventilators back in the 60s had this capability. But if you think about it, if you give a ventilator breath and the patient takes a deep breath, I think I lost my uh, video. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Yep. Well, now we can't. <laughs> can you still see the illustration? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, I, my computer went blank. I don't have, I'm not seeing anything, uh, but I can go ahead and describe it. So when you take a deep breath and let's say the pressure goes up to 40, when the patient starts exhaling, the pressure is going to get lower and lower and lower. And if let's say you're going to put the patient on five of PEEP, that's five centimeters of water pressure. You would set that uh, control at five. And what would happen is the patient, let's say the pressure goes up to 50 when he on, on uh, 
complete inhalation. When he starts to exhale, the pressure is going to drop and it's going to drop. But instead of going to zero, that exhalation valve is going to close at a pressure of five. So what have you done? You've trapped air in the patient's lung. You see that? So that's what PEEP is, positive end expiratory pressure. So what we do is we're applying a pressure on exhalation. We're just not letting the patient completely exhale. We're trapping air in his lung, and therefore that's going to keep those alveoli inflated. And generally what we'll do, one of the ways that we'll treat this uh, uh, what we call refractory or, or refractory or, or a stubborn uh, hypoxemia, which is a low oxygen level, is to put PEEP, is to apply PEEP. And generally we'll use anything from about two in severe cases up to 15 centimeters of PEEP. But the problem with that, again, when you're applying that pressure to the lung, it can create uh, significant problems in terms of uh, uh, blood flow return, loss of cardiac output. Again, you can tear and injure the lung, and then that creates uh, significant problems. Uh, can everybody still hear me okay? Hello? Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Yes. Okay, you're with me. Okay, my screen is uh, is uh, blank, so... <laughs> um, um, uh, so I'm not I'm, I'm not sure what's going on in terms of the video, but I've I've lost um, uh, I've lost video. Okay, so um, that's essentially the way um, PEEP works. Now, patients will end up on these ventilators, and oftentimes they're still able to breathe a little bit on their own. And so, on these newer ventilators, they can do that. They can continue to let's say if we put them on a rate of twelve, they're not going to breathe much on their own, and and usually their lungs are tired. As a matter of fact, if you go, let's say, two or three days where you're just huffing and puffing and you're having to work through all this extra work just to get a, in a little bit of oxygen and, and get rid of a little bit of carbon dioxide and you're getting worse and worse and worse, you're going to reach the point where you're going to fatigue. And when that happens, you just kind of slow your breathing. You can't take a deep breath anymore. So we'll put the patient on the ventilator and we'll take over breathing for them. We'll do all that work for them and we'll allow that patient to rest and allow that disease process, hopefully with antibiotics and, and the other therapies for that lung to get well enough to where we can take the ventilator off. And one of the key things we're gonna look at is the amount of pressure it takes to ventilate. So if you're pushing 500 cc's into the patient's lung every breath and it's taking, um, we'll say 50 centimeters, 50 centimeters of water pressure to do that. What's happening if one morning you go in and now it's only taking 40 to push that air in and the next day it's only taking 30 to push that air in. What that's telling us is the lung isn't as stiff. It's getting more compliant. And that's a good thing. That tells us the lung's getting well. So once we reach a point where that pressure drops down, there we go, I can see everybody now. Once we get to that point where that pressure's down below 30, uh, that means the lung is really compliant enough where the patient can probably work enough to pull the air in on his own. And so generally at that point, we're going to start cutting the rate down. So let's say he's been on 12 and we've been completely controlling his ventilation. We'll cut it to 10 and see how he does. And we'll cut it down to eight and see what he does. And what's going to happen is in, in the best case scenario anyway, is the patient's going to start breathing on their own. And now instead of him breathing zero and we're giving him 14 breaths, now we're giving him eight and he's taking eight. And see on each breath he exhales, we can also monitor what his volume is. Now his volume, uh, like I said, typical is around 500 cc's. Well, if he's breathing on his own and he's only pushing out 50 cc's, then we're gonna have to leave him on the ventilator a little bit longer until he's stronger and he can, he can breathe more and more on his own. And so that's, that's what we call the weaning process, where we'll slowly reduce um, the frequency until the patient is breathing more and more on his own. And then we'll do what we call um, uh, fitness tests, if you will. And there's four or five uh, little tests we can do. We can have the patient take a deep breath and blow out all his air and see how, what that volume is. And there's a nomogram that we can use for a certain age and weight and height and uh, that kind of thing, how much a person ought to be able to breathe out. We can also close off the end of the endotracheal tube and have him inspire and see how much negative pressure he creates and how that, that tells us how strong the lungs are. Um, and a lot of it's just trial and error. 
a lot of times we'll cut the patient's rate down and then they'll do fine. And then sometimes they start breathing hard and fast and they're struggling again to breathe. We have to turn it back up. But generally in the best case scenario, um, as the patient's lungs get less and less stiff, it's taking less pressure to ventilate them. We can bring that pressure down and then we can take them off the PEEP, bring their oxygen concentration down, wean them off that till we reach the point to where now we can, we can uh, take them off the ventilator and we'll usually do a trial off the, well, they're still on the ventilator, but we cut the rate off. And then we'll leave them on there for a few hours uh, and, and maybe even longer. And if everything goes well, then we'll uh, take the um, ventilator off. And if he's breathing fine on his own, we'll extubate, which means we'll pull that endotracheal tube out. And, um, uh, and generally the patients, by the way, if they've had an endotracheal tube down your throat, uh, you, you, your voice is a little hoarse uh, for, uh, for a few hours or a few days. And that's because that tube has gone, is pushed down between your vocal cords in your lungs. So when you pull it out uh, or when it's in there, it's been pressing against the vocal cords. And that's why the patient experiences some trouble speaking when they first pull that tube out. Um, I might also say at about 10 days, if the patient's still on a ventilator, you start to worry about uh, just really causing injury to the vocal cords and the larynx because that tube is passed between the vocal cords, as I mentioned. And usually in about 10 days, if it looks like the patient is still going to require continuous mechanical ventilation for some time, we'll perform a tracheotomy where we'll, the physician will make an incision into the windpipe and we'll put a tracheostomy tube, which is much smaller, and what that's gonna do is that's actually bypassing the vocal cords and then we connect the ventilator uh, to the hole in the patient's neck, the tube that's in his neck and his windpipe. And see that bypasses the upper airway and we don't have to worry about damaging the, the vocal cords. So that decision is usually made somewhere within seven to 10 days um, uh, post intubation. That is once we put the tube in, the, the clock starts ticking. Um, Okay, um, now I'm gonna show you a, a few s slides. So uh, Jenny, we're ready for the next slide. I'm gonna move through these rather, rather quickly. Can I get the next slide, Jenny? Okay, um, since Rotary is involved with um, uh, uh, helping to eradicate polio, I thought I might mention that there was a machine invented back in the 30s by a guy, well, actually the late 20s by a guy named Drinker. It was called the Iron Lung. And the way the thing works is you put the patient in this box and you have this uh, kind of cushion of polyfoam that you tighten around the patient's neck. Well, when it was first invented, they just used soft leather and they would tighten that around the patient's neck. And then you'll look at the end of that machine. It's got a diaphragm. And when that diaphragm pushes out, that creates a negative pressure in the box and the patient takes in a breath. And we used to have one of these at ICC and I'd put my students in them and and when you'd pull out that diaphragm, they'd take, they would take a breath where they wanted it or not. It worked by negative pressure. Now, these machines don't work on patients with stiff lungs like pneumonia or COVID or anything like that. It's primarily only is functional on patients with normal lungs. So the perfect candidate for this machine would be a child who has normal lungs, but is paralyzed. And that's polio. And back in the 30s and 40s, uh, in a couple typical years in the late 40s, mid 40s, uh, there were many, you know, it's 30,000 children uh, in, the, in the nation who were received uh, iron lung uh, ventilation. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Next, there we go. This is uh, Dr. Drinker. He was a young engineer, matter of fact, from Harvard. And he uh, worked at the Children's Hospital. And you see him here. Uh, he's actually describing the iron lung and how it would work. Uh, and he was uh, given the credit for being the, this technology, uh, the, the, the theory of how this work came long before Drinker, but he was actually the first one to actually create a machine uh, that, that, that employed that technology. Next slide, please. And I think that was in 28 or 29. And this is what the first iron lung looked like. And it worked off two um, vacuum cleaner motors. That's what was hooked to the diaphragm that, that kind of sucked the air out of the box. And as you can imagine, 
it leaked all the time because you couldn't actually get it so tight around the patient's neck that, you know, it would choke them, but you'd get a tight seal that was comfortable. So you'd still have a little leaking. So you'd have to turn the pressure up to compensate for that leak. And it was hard to take care of the patient. Imagine, you know, uh, uh, changing, a, giving a bath or something like that to a patient uh, that's in this box. Uh, it, it created real problems, but it worked and it saved a lot of lives back in the 40s and 50s. Um, next slide. Uh, they even had iron lungs for little babies. And here's a, you know, an example of that. Um, next slide. Uh, the the uh, pandemic of polio back in the 50s was significant. And this is a, a photo from 1950. We had hundreds and hundreds of these iron lungs. And again, this is almost all children almost all children, but some young adults and a few adults, but mostly it impacted, uh, uh, you know, small children and, uh, you know, adolescents. But, um, and, and notice this particular iron lung looks a lot different than the one I showed you that Drinker um, made. About 1948, a guy named Emerson, um, who was also an engineer, actually perfected the iron lung. And that's what you see in the, these pictures. So this is not a drinker iron lung. This is actually an Emerson lung. Next slide. And this is uh, uh, Emerson. I actually had the opportunity to meet this guy. He was uh, well into his uh, 80s when I met him at a, at a conference <coughs> here and had a chance to talk to him about his, about his machine. Uh, next slide. Uh, just another example of um, uh, these these children uh, were essentially healthy in every other way except the fact that their diaphragm and uh, accessory muscle breathing were, were, were paralyzed. Uh, and some of these kids uh, spent months in these things, um, but many of them recovered. And um, um, so a um, little technology goes a long way. But uh, just wanted to mention that about polio and the iron lung since we're Rotarians. Next slide, please. And this is the, um, the bag I showed you a moment ago. This is a, um, actually about a 1958 model. Uh, the Ambu bag uh, was, it, uh, was uh, invented by a guy in Switzerland. And um, um, he, it was primarily initially used. So this was really the first resuscitator, first manual resuscitator. And uh, it hit the market in the late 50s. And by probably 1965, every hospital in the world uh, that could buy one owned one of these, um, uh, uh, what he called Ambu bags. They were first in ambulances and they became so popular that they then moved on to hospitals. And he called them an Ambu bag, which was the first four letters of the word ambulance. Um, as a matter of fact, these were so popular. I remember when I first started working at the medical center in the mid seventies, there was an Ambu bag, we called them on, every um, uh, crash cart and um, it even became a verb, uh, get me a, let's ambu this guy. How long did you ambu him? Um, so they were very popular. As a matter of fact, uh, today there's numerous uh, manual resuscitators on the market, but a lot of folks still call them an ambu bag, even though that's not, um, it, uh, you know, that's not the, this, that was a brand name and a specific de device. Matter of fact, I still call them all, whether they're ambu bags or not, um, uh, different manufacturers make them. I call it an Ambu bag. Next slide. And this is the inventor, uh, uh, Dr. Hess. He's a, an engineer and along with uh, another fellow whose name I can't remember, who is an anesthesiologist, uh, they invented the Ambu bag. As uh, matter of fact, they had other products, uh, monitoring devices, uh, and the Ambu bag became so uh, popular and uh, that they uh, actually changed the name of their company to the Ambu Corporation. Um, next slide. And there's an example of a, a more modern day Ambu bag. Mine's a 56 model. <laughs> Let's move on to the next slide. This is the Emerson ventilator, the same guy that uh, took Drinker's iron lung and, and uh, uh, perfected it, uh, actually invented probably the first mechanical ventilator that was used um, in hospitals. And I actually worked with this machine, came out in the late 50s, early 60s, and these were still around in the early 70s at the medical center. But you can see it's, it's pretty crude and it only has four or five controls. You didn't even have a rate control. You set the inspiratory time, the expiratory time. It didn't deliver oxygen. You had to take, we took a um, ice pick uh, 
and poked a hole in the tubing and then put an oxygen tube in there and, and bleed and bled in oxygen from a flow meter. So it didn't, you know, that was pretty crude. Um, had a pressure mono, uh, manometer where we could measure pressure. It had a crank where you cranked up to deliver the volume. And uh, it had a fail safe alarm that is a power loss alarm. And that was about it and everything else. You couldn't even measure exhale volume with this machine. You were just guessing at how much volume you were given. Um, it might, it, when you look at this, you might think it looks kind of like a washing machine. And actually that's exactly what it was. He contracted with uh, Westinghouse uh, who made washing machines and <laughs> some of the earlier model of washing machines. And the chassis is actually a um, washing machine. And then the top was the lid that well, they, they took that off. That's uh, when they arrived, arrived at the Emerson's factory, they took the lid off and replaced it with that stainless steel top. And then it didn't have anything in the inside. They just bought the frame from Westinghouse. Let's go to the next slide. That's the inside of the Emerson ventilator. And if you look kind of toward the bottom, you'll see this kind of round looking pot. That's actually a pressure cooker that had holes drilled in it to uh, add the inspiratory and expiratory lines. And it's sitting on a hot plate. So these machines were really, really crude, but uh, they got the job done. Next slide, please. Uh, the bird ventilator, a small compact ventilator. You may have seen these in the hospital. Um, they had a flow control and pressure control, and that's about it. No exhale volume. Um, you had to, they had no compressor. You had to hook them up to um, uh, 100 PSI oxygen or to an oxygen tank, but they were pretty crude, but they, they worked. Next slide. And here's the inventor of um, the uh, bird ventilator, Forrest Bird. I met him at a convention. Uh, next slide. I'm going to move through these last ones pretty fast. Um, I've lost my video again, so I don't know really what, um, what I'm looking at. If you will, Jenny, let's do this since it's uh, 15 till. If you will, uh, scroll on down to the uh, probably the second to the last slide. Again, my video's out, so I can't I can't see you guys. Can everybody still hear me? Yes, yeah. and I've I've got a picture of a of another of a ventilator, but it's a graphic, not a drawn one. That's what the slide that's next to the last is. Okay, go go back up one, back to the front box, go one. Okay, now it's a screen with um, readouts. Looks like what we would see if someone was hooked to a ventilator, maybe. Yeah, okay. And that that is a modern day ventilator. That's the kind of thing we use now. And that, uh, the, the, that screen, we can change that screen to about six or seven different things. And you can dial in oxygen, you can dial in respiratory rate, it measures exhale volume, and it'll actually pull up graphics where you can look at these uh, different pressure waveforms and flow waveforms, and it'll calculate compliance, it'll calculate resistance for you. It has all sorts of built-in alarms. Um, you can interface this to uh, a telemetry unit at the at the nursing station and even now you can have it on your phone so I can be in another patient's room and that ventilator go off I can pull up my phone and I can see what those settings are and uh, it, we've just come a long way with that technology uh, if you look at that first ventilator the Emerson and compare it to to what we're able to do it, do now it's just a, a fascinating um, the things that those ventilators will do. But it still comes down to this. Most of all of those bells and whistles are monitoring devices that tell us uh, uh, how the patient's lungs, the lung dynamics, if you will. But it really comes down to it delivers a volume at a certain uh, rate or number of times per minute at a, at a certain flow rate, which decides how fast, so how much, how many, how fast. That's still the primary thing that a ventilator does. Just like when you get into a car, whether it's a Buick or whether it's a Jeep, it's got a steering wheel, it's got a transmission, and it's gonna have a, a brake and an accelerator. And so uh, all ventilators still, it's those three things, volume, uh, frequency, and, and, and flow. Um, I'm gonna stop now, I can't see the screen, um, and, and uh, uh, take questions. There we go, it popped back up. Are there any questions? <laughs>
Harold, what does a patient do just before they insert that tube? How does, what's that process? Okay, they, they have um, a, a couple drugs that uh, uh, there's one in particular uh, that the physician can give and it can be given, uh, you know, IV and it can be pushed in the bloodstream pretty quick and you get almost instantaneous um, sedation. And it lasts uh, a couple minutes and there's another drug that you can give that will reverse it almost instantaneously. So um, we'll, we'll give that drug and then uh, give it a couple uh, well, not even a couple minutes, you can give it 30 seconds and um, you can go ahead and pass that tube without much trouble. And then the patient's going to be on some form of sedation. You can't, you can't uh, tolerate that tube down your throat. So uh, patients are oftentimes sedated when they're on ventilators. Now, if it's during a cardiac arrest uh, where the patient stops uh, breathing and their heart stops, uh, we don't we don't give any any sort of a sedation or anesthesia. You get that tube in there as fast as you can. And the patient, if they're if they're unconscious, they're not aware of you putting that tube in anyway. Uh, now, when they wake up, they'll start fighting the tube and the ventilator, and then we sedate them. Any other questions? Hey, Harold. Yeah, Harold. It seems like I'm hearing more um, people coming off ventilators than maybe earlier. Is that a combination of factors? Um, and I'm talking about related to COVID. Uh, is that better medicine, learning what people need, et cetera? Or what are your thoughts on that? I think it's all, I think it's a combination of things. I think um, uh, they're learning how to, how to treat the patients uh, 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 better. And, and understand when they go in these rooms, these, uh, the um, folks that are caring for these patients, you know, they're decked out in full uh, regalia in terms of gloves and masks and, and that kind of thing. And, it, it can be kind of tricky uh, in terms of the settings on the ventilators to get the optimal oxygenation ventilation at the lowest pressure possible. So I think they're just, just you know, they're learning how to do that and learning what particular ventilator mode to put on the patient. And I think it's not only a combination of the, of the respiratory therapist understanding those patients better, but the physicians in nursing in terms of how they treat the patients. But one of the, th one of the things, for example, and I'm not sure at what point in the, in this pandemic this occurred, but they, uh, they, they learned that putting the patient in the prone position helped, that is flipping them over on their stomach. And that allowed for greater expansion of the, of the lung bases, which are primarily you know, posterior. And uh, so you, you were able to ventilate the patient uh, at a lower pressure. So yeah, Tom, I think it's a combination of things. Anything else? Okay. Well, okay there. Great job, Harold. Thank you, sir. Robbie, thank 